Welcome to the second series of Future Makers, your invitation to cutting-edge debates on our changing society with leading thinkers from the University of Oxford and beyond. If you've been listening to our podcast since the beginning, you'll know that we've already covered two huge areas of research that may have a dramatic influence on our future, artificial intelligence and quantum computing. In this new series, we'll explore a topic that may impact humanity more than anything else, climate change. At Oxford, we have a huge number of researchers working across the fields of climate, energy, waste, water, food and biodiversity. And over the next 10 episodes, we'll delve into their expertise, exploring the actions individuals and governments can take, how we can change our current systems and lives, and even asking, Who is to blame for the current state of affairs? Today we're going to start with the 2018 special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees C from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which broke into the public consciousness through media reporting that we only had 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe. But was this really the conclusion of the IPCC report? If it was, do we really have only 12 years to fix things? And if not, how soon should we take action? With me to discuss this today are Professor Miles Allen, one of the coordinating lead authors on the IPCC's special report on 1.5 degrees, having also served on the IPCC's third, fourth and fifth assessments. Professor Helen Johnson from Oxford's Earth Sciences Department who researches ocean circulation and its role in the climate system, and Dr James Painter from the Reuters Institute at Oxford, who focuses on the portrayals of climate change in online and offline media. Hello and welcome to you all. Hello. Hello. Hi. Miles, as one of the authors of this report, I'll come to you first. Could you take us through its background? Who commissioned it? Who wrote it? Is it possible to summarise its conclusions for us? Sure. Well, it's a, it was a very new report for the IPCC because it came out of the Paris Agreement. So in 2015, we had this landmark agreement, uh, 190 world governments signing up to limit warming to well below two degrees. And much to everybody's surprise, including the phrase to pursue efforts to 1.5 degrees. And many of us in the academic community were completely taken aback by this. We did not expect that. Apparently, we should have seen it coming. Apparently, many developing countries were pushing for this for many years beforehand. But to be honest, we didn't. And one of the conditions of letting that that pursuing efforts phrase through in the Paris Agreement was other countries insisted that there would be a report on essentially was there any benefit to limiting warming over 1.5 deg- to 1.5 degrees as opposed to allowing it to go to 2 degrees? And was it even possible to do so? Because a lot of people at the time were scratching their heads and saying, we can't even do that. And I remember a colleague, Michael Grubb, actually said at the time that he felt 1.5 degrees was incompatible with democracy, um, which is strong words. Um, and so a-, a lot of people wanted it delved into to-, to work out what was actually feasible. And what conclusions were reached? Well, on the two big questions, there was clearly a benefit to limiting warming. There were were clearly documentable impacts of climate change that were much better at 1.5 degrees than they would be at 2. I mean, they're not great now. We're already losing lots of stuff. People are being killed by climate change already. At 1.5 degrees, we lose three quarters of the world's warm water corals. At 2 degrees, we lose them all. So, you know, it's not good but it's definitely better than going to two. So that was one of the key messages of the report was that it was worth trying. And the second key message really was that it was possible still, just, but to do it would involve immediate, unprecedentedly fast emission reductions. And is it fairly arbitrary where exactly you draw the boundary? Two degrees, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7... Yeah, exactly. I mean, this happens, All people say, well, could we go a little bit further? You know, and, and every years, every decade's delay is another quarter of a degree of warming ratcheted up. So, you know, people are arguing now about, can we afford to delay action to 2030? Most people are saying we can't. If we did, then whatever we did today to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, we'd have to settle for 1.75 degrees instead. So we'd have an extra quarter of a degree of warming. Would that kill us all? No. Uh, Would it kill some of us? Sadly, yes. So the analogy I use when I'm talking to striking school kids about this 
is it's a bit like a smoker deciding when to stop. You know, if, if you're saying to the smoker, look, it's not going to make that much difference if you just have one more cigarette, you're not really helping. And, and that's the message we have to contend with, with saying, well, you know, just an extra tenth of a degree won't make that much more difference. You're going to end up somewhere you don't want to go. And presumably the measures that you need to take to bring it down lower become more and more extreme as well. It's not just a matter of timing. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, that was another of the key findings of the report. Um, because carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere, every year's delay, if you want to limit warming to one and a half degrees, every year you delay starting reductions, you've lost two years in the amount of time you've got left to get emissions to zero. Right. And that's just basic geometry. You know, if, if I can wave my hands, it doesn't work well on the radio, but imagine, imagine an ever steepening cliff that you've got to get emissions down as you, as you dither over when to start, because you want to keep it's the area under the curve that matters. Apologies for the right. non-mathematicians listening, but maybe I can rewind slightly on that one because I was kind of getting a bit wound up. Um, so it, it's exactly analogous to braking distances in a car. The longer you put off hitting the brakes, the faster you have to decelerate to stop at the stop sign. And so if you're not quite sure how well your brakes work, and that is the situation we're in, we don't know how long it'll take us to stop climate change, it's a good idea to test them well in advance. Um, and ev as I say, every year's delay is two years lost in the amount of time we've got to get emissions to zero. Right. And you mentioned uncertainty there. Presumably some of that uncertainty is to do with the basic science and some of it is to do with what might happen in the future, which is politics, industry, etc. How much disagreement is there on the science? On the basic science of how much warming globally is caused by a certain amount of carbon dioxide, there's actually this uncertainty, perhaps around a factor of two, um, but it's not really contested. Everybody understands what's going on. There are a number of different ingredients to what determines what warming we end up at, but that's well understood uncertainty, if you like. Um, on how much harm each additional degree of warming does, that's actually much more difficult to quantify because it depends on who you are. One of the things the report was heavily challenged on was the fact that we didn't give a global number for how much one and a half degrees of warming would cost versus two degrees of warming. But the problem is, if you do that, you've got to decide how you weigh up a flooded Bangladesh against a flooded Florida. Now, in terms of nominal land values, the flooded Florida is much worse, in quotes. But, of course, many more people would probably die if you flooded Bangladesh. So what's the bigger impact? And that's, you know, that makes it very hard and much more contestable what harm each additional degree of warming does. And that's an area where there's a much greater debate between people. And it's not really just a matter of, you know, scientists scratching their heads. It's also a matter of you know, ethicists and people getting involved to decide, you know, what the priorities are and so on. And on the third one, which I actually, I think is the biggest uncertainty of all, is actually how fast we can get emissions down. You know, I, I, I just, we've never really tried to get global emissions down w with any seriousness. And so it's this matter of, you know, we're driving the truck down the road, we've never really touched the brakes. And so we don't really know how well they'll work. How how effective will climate policies be in reducing emissions dramatically? We know the kind of policies that can reduce emissions by 10 or 20%. We know they work. We, we know that they can actually work quite quickly. But to get emissions to zero and to do that in a matter of you know, less than a generation, I, I, that's, that's hard. And that involves presumably both technological issues, but also crucially political ones. When you're dealing with democratic countries, we know from our own recent experience how hard it can be to predict what's going to happen. Absolutely. And there's a lot of, you know, it's interesting that works both ways. None of us would have predicted the school strike movement a year ago. You know, Greta Thunberg was sitting on a, you know, rainy steps of, a, of the parliament not that long ago, on our own. Um, and now it's a global movement. So things can change remarkably quickly. And that's actually something that increasingly, I, I, actually scientists here in Oxford are actually studying um, the, what, they, what they call these sensitive intervention points or the sort of tipping points in the climate system. People often get very preoccupied about physical tipping points, the idea of 
you know, runaway greenhouse warming and, and uh, rapid changes in the Arctic and so on. But I think actually one of the most interesting areas and under-researched areas of tipping point research is, is how do social systems suddenly shift from going in one direction to another? And that's something a lot of people are doing some really interesting research on at the moment. Thank you, Miles. There's obviously a huge potential for change there. I'm also interested in delving a bit more into how fast the science has been moving. So, Helen, how do you see the science having moved on since the IPCC report? Or are we on safe ground talking about the main findings of this report as our current understanding? We're certainly on safe ground talking about the main findings of the of the report. Whilst you know climate scientists are beavering away on understanding more about the details of the picture and the feedbacks involved in uh, in the climate system all the time, but the main none of the main messages in this report have changed. None of the, so far as I know, none of the. Um, conclusions about the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees have have changed since this report. The report focuses on pathways to uh, to getting to 1.5, and, and that involves models that doesn't just involve the science, but also involves uh, you know the human systems. And and that to me seems to be somewhere where we may have seen more change along the lines of what Miles has just been discussing. You know this idea that there's potentially there's a there's a big social interest and movement now, uh, and the public acceptability for action and dramatic action is is potentially higher and and you know i guess I'd like to know more about those models, um, the types of models on which the pathways are based and what assumptions they make on the, the, you know, the human systems. They're one of the hardest parts of the problem because you're talking about modelling the global economy. You're talking about modelling nine billion people's behaviour over the next hundred years. But they also rely on existing, presumably they factor in assumptions about existing technology and existing systems as well. They do, yeah. And so there's a sort of, there's they, they, they have models of how technology develops, models of how we learn, which are deep, which are argued about yeah. very stridently. Um, and this is why I stress, this is the area where I think people are really disagreeing fundamentally with each other. We don't really disagree with each other fundamentally on the basic climate science anymore, but on questions like, you know, will solving global warming actually be a net cost or net benefit to society? Many people think, when the, when the report came out, the big headline was, you know, one and a half degrees will cost 2.5% of global GDP. That's a huge amount of money. Oh, you know. And actually, there's huge uncertainty in what this transition will cost because it's such a big change. It's doing things so differently that to say you even know the sign of the cost is actually quite brave. And that doesn't factor in the cost of not acting either, right? You know, to yeah, weigh, right. weigh that up against the cost of doing nothing. You know, yeah, ultimately. That, and that's that's the sort of, as it were, the sticky cost of of, of the solutions that are out there. Yeah. Which, by the way was it itself a very misleading number because what the report actually found was that we'd spend 2.8% of GDP, to be sort of precise, on the energy system between now and 2050 to achieve a 1.5 degree future. But what everybody didn't notice was that just along the, along the graph from that 2.8% was that we'd spend 2% of GDP on our energy system just to keep the lights on, building fossil fuel plants in a completely climate, let's ignore the problem scenario. So the point is, it's the difference. It's 40% more, which is you know, a lot of money, but nevertheless, it's 40% more to build an energy system that is fit for purpose and wouldn't cause global warming compared to saving the money. And, and that's something which, annoyingly, our own chancellor at the time sort of didn't really pick up on either and was sort of grumbling away about that this is going to cost a trillion pounds a year and that sort of thing. And, oh, I can't remember what the numbers were he was throwing around, but completely missed the fact we're going to invest in the energy system anyway. So it's investing differently as opposed to, you know, just investing more. Yeah, it seems there's a lot of scope for spinning these reports in different ways. I mean, to my mind, 2.5%, if that's the solution to a major global problem, doesn't sound like an awful lot. You've explained why it's not even really 2.5%. But um, something I'd like to ask you, James, I mean, this report seemed to get much more attention than previous IPCC reports uh, for various reasons, some to do with cost, some to do with impact and so on. Why do you think it was so much more impactful? Um, I'm not sure there's evidence that this report got more traction than previous IPC reports. Uh, we've IPCC reports, we've done, we've studied AR5 and AR4, and they do tend to get a lot of coverage, particularly the natural science ones. So I'm not 
absolutely sure that the assumption that this one was hugely different. However, the important point is it did get a lot of uh, coverage in the media. And I think it's important to try and understand why that is the case. I think just to row back, and I hope Miles agrees with me, one of the really exciting things about the launch of the 1.5 degree report was that the IPCC had gone through a really quite intensive interrogation of its own communication methods, principles and practices. And it came up with a number of recommendations about how on earth can we make sure that this incredibly solid, complex science gets communicated in a way that journalists, policymakers, the general public understand it. Because I'm sure Miles would be the first to admit, a lot of it is really complicated. You know, a lot of it is complex, a lot of it is uncertain, particularly in the summary for policymakers. And indeed, there have been some academic studies suggesting that you need a PhD to understand them. So, so, you know, this isn't meant to be rude at all. It's just a fact, you know, that science is difficult, it is complex. And so, to cut a long story short, one of the results of this deliberation was that science communicators or science journalists who really understood the science far better than I did should sit alongside the different working groups and work with them right from the beginning to try and understand, OK, this is the science, but how are we going to communicate it? Um, and as I understand it, that process started very early. So why I thought it was really interesting, and I was lucky enough to be a very minor part in that communication process, was that the climate scientists were constantly being asked, OK, what is the messaging around this report that will make it more understandable, both to the general public and possibly policymakers and to the media? So do correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Miles, but my understanding was that there was a sort of distillation of key messages that were t discussed with the climate scientists. And the challenge there is to boil it down to sort of relatively simple, understandable messages, but while respecting the science. And I don't mean to flatter Miles, but he's very good at that. I'm not sure that all climate scientists really, really wrestle with how you communicate this. They're much better at communicating to other scientists. There were some key messages that were agreed by quite a, a number of climate scientists on the day before the press conference. And these were every little bit of warming matters, which got a lot of traction in the media. Climate change is happening and the impacts are happening already. There is unprecedented, and that word unprecedented, I think, was quite well discussed and, 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 and thought about, unprecedented systemic changes in some areas will, will be needed. And that these solutions are compatible with the SDGs. Those were the broad... Uh, SDGs? Uh, with the Sustainability Development Goals. In other words, for developing countries, you didn't have to take such drastic action that it was going to harm your attempts to stop development or to promote development and, and poverty. The problem is, which I'm sure we'll discuss, is that some of those headline thoughts really did get picked up. And certainly the unprecedented change, certainly the sort of call for action, uh, certainly every little bit matters. There was also this date, 2030, that got into some part, at least two paragraphs of the summary for policymakers. And I blame myself and others that we didn't really anticipate how that might be misinterpreted, seized upon as a sort of deadline narrative by some mainstream media, but I think much less when we crunch the numbers, which I can explain in the research, it did get picked up by the media as well. So to answer your question, why did it get a lot of coverage? I think, A, the messaging was very, very strong. I think the, there were some really good attempts to communicate eff uh, effectively uh, around it. And, um, you know, the IPCC did a very good job training and being with its climate scientists in promoting that work right across, um, you know, they had a lot of journalists there at the launch and a lot of journalists listening in. What damage do you think the 2030 figure and its prominence has done? My gosh, personally, and I'm sure Mars will disagree with me, I think there are big downsides about that narrative. I think it's not helpful to promote this view that, you know, everything happens before 2030 and then we fall off a cliff. I think it's dangerous because in many countries, particularly the US, denialists and sceptics can say, well, yet again, this is an example of climate alarmism by the IPCC. And guess what? We get to 2030 and it's not the end of the planet. I think, though, against that, you really need to think terribly carefully 
about what we know about how that type of climate emergency or climate deadline narratives lands with different publics. There is some social science on it, survey work, but I suspect anecdotally that the way that that travelled, particularly via young people on social media, did help, in inverted commas, to create a movement that we're now seeing. I've got no evidence for that, but I'm suggesting that it may have helped, not necessarily in our understanding of the science, but in our mobilisation and communication. Simple messages help when you're trying to mobilise lots of people. Exactly. Let, let me give you a very quick example. I don't know how many of you saw the IPBES report. That's the IPC equivalent on biodiversity, which came out uh, in May this year. They had a simple headline, one million species at risk of extinction. Prior to that report, IPBES reports had got virtually no media coverage. Mm. Get a headline like that that is actually disputed in the academic community. How do we know that it's a million species? Is it really a million? Is it more accurate to say something else? But it undoubtedly had a huge impact on a successful headline grabbing statistic that has had more coverage for that report than any other. So I think there's a whole debate about the merits of headlines for grabbing attention. As a former journalist, I'm wary of them, but I can see why many people would say, well, hey, wait a minute, that's actually been very helpful for mobilising action and engagement with that issue. So I think it's a disputed one, and I don't think there's a simple answer. But the kind of action we need for climate change is action that lasts well over 12 years. As you said, I mean, the big danger is that these striking teenagers look back when they're trying to get their first mortgage around 2030 and think, well, that was a load of rubbish, wasn't it? And and just switch off and think about other issues. I mean, you know, that's my big concern. I think you're right to have that concern, but what's the evidence on the basis of social science and what we understand of what maintains mobilisation, that one particular narrative has a particular effect on a particular segment of the population that when or if it is shown not to be true, collapses. I don't know any evidence. It may be your intuitive feel that that's dangerous, but what's the evidence, Would I would say to you? This is a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, we're in the age of Brexit, where <laughs> it seems as though people's views on that matter are relatively impervious to factual discoveries. We're in a difficult position. If we're trying to get mobilisation, there is this risk, isn't there, that the science gets misrepresented and people later on will look back and say, oh, that scare story turned out not to be true. Helen, I'd like to ask you, as as somebody who's actively involved in scientific research in this area, how far you are able to make predictions that in five or ten years can be looked back at and people will say, oh, she got it right or she got it wrong. Everyone knows that all, all models are wrong, <laughs> um, including the climate models. But but the key thing is that they're useful. Um, all models are useful. Most models are useful, even if they're wrong. Um, we know that the models, as Mars was talking about, the integrated assessment models, the climate models too, we know that, that they are missing some elements. But we hope by the kind of research that I do, that um, they have the essential physics that determine the main trajectory uh, that the climate system will follow right in them. And, and your research is on ocean currents. I'm particularly interested in the Atlantic circulation and the Arctic circulation. And in both cases, what we've been trying to do is really get a handle on the underlying processes, the key physics and dynamics that determine that circulation and the variability and change within that circulation. Um, if we if we want to um, be able to have confidence in our models and to trust that they're doing the right thing, then we really need to understand how things work. You know that there's, as we've said, the climate system is a complicated beast, and the kind of models we use for forecasting climate have lots and lots of bells and whistles. But what we try to do in my group is to strip that apart a bit and say, okay, what are the really fundamental physics that govern the Arctic Ocean circulation, and how are those physics likely telling us that we might expect things to change? And then if that's consistent with the message that we're seeing from um, the climate models, we might have more faith in, in what in what we're seeing. I would guess the models that you're using now are different from ones that you're using, say, five years ago. Yeah. So in the ocean in particular, the natural scales of motion in the, in the ocean are much smaller than the scales of motion in the atmosphere. If you think about uh, an atmospheric low pressure system, well represented by, by weather models um, and climate models. Uh, models divide up the atmosphere in the ocean into little grid boxes and you have plenty of grid boxes within an atmospheric low pressure system. 
system. But in the ocean, the, the equivalent of the atmospheric high and low pressure systems are small eddies and narrow boundary currents. And these things get down to scales of maybe 50 to 100 kilometres at mid-latitudes and even smaller, 10, 10 to 15 kilometres uh, at high latitudes, for example, in the Arctic. And the current generation of models that we're using are, are not able to represent those kind, resolve those kinds of processes um, fully because the grid boxes and the discretization, the size of the boxes used to represent um, the processes going on are on the order of about 100 kilometres. So we have to find other ways of representing these small scale processes in the models that we're using to forecast climate. And that's that's a key reason for really understanding the, the essential physics at play. As computer power um, becomes more available and more, more accessible in terms of uh, cost, um, we're starting to move to higher resolution ocean models and start to in- include some of these processes more explicitly in the models. And is that consistently le- leading to improvements with regard to empirical predictions? Well, things don't always improve when you go to higher resolution. <laughs> and that's partly because as you move um, to higher resolution, some of the parameterization, some of the, the um, mechanisms we've used for representing these small scale processes in the higher in, in the course of resolution models, we don't need them anymore as we get towards smaller scales, but we might need something bridging the gap. So, so for example, ocean models at one degree have quite robust parameterizations of ocean eddies in them. And ocean models at 12th of a degree do a reasonable job over much of the globe of representing ocean eddies. But in the middle, so the new generation of climate models with uh, ocean grid boxes about a quarter of a degree in size, it's really not clear yet. We need some modification of our old parameterizations, but we're representing some of that um, some of that ocean variability. So that's where a lot of research lies really is in, in how best to how best to represent these processes as our computational abilities improve. One of the hardest questions I get asked when I'm talking about this stuff to the public by people who really people who are really on it is the fact that climate models when they when they see the sort of plots of what climate models do they respond remarkably boringly to rising greenhouse gases. They just sort of go up in a straight line. And then if you reduce emissions to zero, they sort of calmly stabilise and temperatures evolve relatively predictably. And people often ask me, how confident are you that, that that the real climate will behave in that in that kind of way and that we won't get some kind of tipping point between now and 2030 that'll suddenly, it'll all head off into some new direction. And I, you know, I often think of your, your research in that. And I don't know, what's what do you answer people when they press you on that? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really know what to say. I mean, I, I feel like we stand as much chance of answering that question with um, simpler physical models than we do with state-of-the-art um, general circulation models, you know, the climate models that are used as the underpinning the IPCC reports. For example, I'm interested in the overturning circulation in the Atlantic, and this is a large-scale overturning where water in the upper kilometre flows northwards, and it gets transformed in the high latitude North Atlantic to colder, denser water that flows southwards again at depth. And, and that's taking a lot of carbon and heat down into the deep ocean with it. And it's carrying heat northwards towards us in Europe. And there's a, there's a real worry that that will weaken as a result of anthropogenic. So uh, we we'll lose the Gulf Stream and our relatively warm... This is my chance to dispel the myth about the Gulf Stream. And Fine, do. <laughs> yeah, do. Great. The thing about the Gulf Stream is that it has two elements to it. So part of it is associated with this large scale overturning circulation that I'm talking about. Another part of it is is simply to do with the winds blowing over the Atlantic, which cause large gyres, so large circular circulations, uh, which have very intense boundary currents on the western side of the basin. And so far as we know, we don't expect those to change significantly as a result of um, of global warming. And so the Gulf Stream will always will always be there. Um, the, the net amount of heat transported northwards through the Atlantic may well change, but it's not really the Gulf Stream that we're that we're worrying about. Okay. But, but yes, certainly the net transfer of heat northward, we might expect that to, to change. And and there's lots of key processes important in determining the strength of that circulation. We don't have an equation. We can't write down an equation for the strength of the overturning circulation. And many of the processes we know to be important, we know are not well represented in climate models. You know, these are things like convection in the ocean, which takes place on scales of about a kilometre. Dense water flowing out from the Nordic seas into the Atlantic, um, so which is 
involves turbulent flows close to the bottom and things that are very difficult for climate models to do. Small eddies that we've been talking about, narrow boundary currents. And so um, it's very hard to say whether this circulation is likely to have an abrupt change and if so, at what point, um, based on the results of, of climate models. But we are um, tackling this from a range of other angles as well. You know, We have observing arrays out in the Atlantic trying to look at the, mon- monitor the strength of this circulation and connect it up to the various things that that may be forcing it, the winds and the um, heat loss and evaporation over bits of the the Atlantic. So I feel like we're getting a, a striving to get a better um, handle on on how it actually works which is the you know the, the, the first base if you want to say how it's going to change but this is a model of science evolving as it should with more and more refined investigations and models and greater computational power and so forth but miles you were all authoring the, the IPCC report you must have been faced with uncertainties of these kinds coming from lots of different areas of climate science and yet the message that came out was portrayed as a relatively simple one. So the way the IPCC process works, fortunately for us, is it's not our job to do the science. The job of the IPCC is to say where the science has got to. And so we pull together papers written by everybody, colleagues and, my, and you know, you look at your own papers as well, you look at other people's papers, you're not, you, you draw all this together and you, you try and pull out what can be said on the basis of the literature at the time. And because lots of different things are going on in different parts of the world, there is a certain averaging effect. And you do get this relatively predictable response of global temperatures to increasing accumulating carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which has happened in the past. We've seen how global temperatures have responded to the accumulation of carbon dioxide. Back in 1977, Bill Nordhaus made a prediction. uh, It's a hand-drawn graph and predicted in 1977 at a time when global temperatures were falling. And indeed, you know, Time magazine had a cover around that time saying it was new ice age on the way. Bill Nordhaus and a small number of scientists knew that carbon dioxide was accumulating in the climate system. They understood what that would do. And he predicted we would get to one degree around 2015. And he nailed it. He also predicted, by the way, just to depress you, that we get to two degrees around 2040, because he predicted it would accelerate around now. But that was not a, a climate, a physical climate prediction. It was a prediction he made in 19 in the 1970s about how fast we would accelerate our use of fossil fuels if we just carried on with no climate policy. Okay, now that's that's impressive. But you're you're talking now about somebody who at the time was heretical. Not particularly in the climate science community. Uh-huh. Actually, this was, you know. It, it, if you go back and look at what people were saying in the 60s and 70s, this was pretty well-established stuff. Okay. The idea that this was some really controversial... Before 19, the 1950s, this was, this was controversial. But after the 1950s, the fact that rising CO2 would cause global warming was pretty much established so, science. But, but what do you say about heretics that some of the temperature records are not reliable because instrumentation has changed, because you get temperature stations that are situated around conurbations where they're no longer reliable because of all the, all the building that's gone on, that increases in carbon dioxide in the past allegedly came after increases in temperature rather than before things like this i mean there are the there are a lot of people or there seem to be a lot of at least quite noisy people saying um even if there aren't a large number of them they make quite a quite a lot of noise well on the temperature record i mean the person who gets a lot of respect from me uh, is professor muller from california who was making precisely that criticism of the state of global temperature records um, back around 2009. Um, he got a lot of money from the Koch brothers, uh, well-known uh, sort of funders of, of uh, anti anti against the mainstream climate uh, position to redo the analysis and to reassess what was actually going on. They produced their own analysis of global temperatures, which showed actually slightly more warming than the published analyses at the time. And to his great credit, he stood up and said, nope, this was the result. And I don't know whether the Koch brothers asked for their money back, but they presumably weren't that happy with the outcome. Um, and, you know, I think that's, you've, that's what I go back to. If you look at the data, it's obvious what is going on. There is variability in the climate system because of precisely the kind of ocean circulation changes that Helen's talking about. But over, over multiple decades, the world is warming precisely as it was predicted to warm. 
almost entirely in response to the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. James. Sorry to bring in the communication aspect again, but one of the reasons I think why the 1.5 report did sort of land well with journalists and possibly with policymakers and audiences was that there were much less uncertainties in the communication of it um, that people could re- respond to. So as Miles said, the key message is we know how much warming there's been. We know the difference between uh, 1.5 and 2. We know, well, we don't know how much it's going to cost, but there's an awful lot we do know. And I think it, there's an awful lot of literature out there, uh, science communication literature, about this really complex uh, aspect of communicating uncertainties effectively and ranges communicating them effectively in a way that people understand them and the general public think, well, if there are uncertainties, we expect scientists to know things. We find it really difficult when you don't. And there's quite a lot of uh, literature suggesting that if you go in hard saying, well, you know, the temperature, the impact rather will be somewhere between this and this, then people find it really difficult. So I think to go to relate it back to the 1.5 was actually, there was a lot of sort of sort of hard certainties around well, it, maybe. Maybe yeah, I mean, you're wrong. Maybe yeah. you disagree, but no, that's no, what but I in some ways, you were given an easy question. In the sense, if you're if you're at one degree and warming at 0.2 degrees per decade, which is where we reckon we are, and that's a pretty high uh, degree of consensus on that. You don't need to be a climate scientist to know you've got to turn things around fairly quickly if you want to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees. I mean, it's just basic geometry. You know, I, I think in a sense we were given an easy question, and it was possible to say things with much greater certainty about these really ambitious goals than we might have been able to say about you know sort of two degrees versus three degrees of warming, where you've got a whole lot more degrees of freedom. Yeah, no, I know. I agree with all that. But I think it, it does partly relate back, and I don't know when you want to talk about it, to the 2030 issue. If I remember rightly, and you'll remember much better than I, there was a sort of, the 2030 was part of a range of uh, possibilities that was going to happen. And yet it got seized upon uh, without any discussion of the uncertainties and the ranges by journalists, because they needed something solid in their view, in their view, not in the science, not in my view, to make the science more understandable. If you come up with a message, we need to take action and look, this is what's happening. They'll immediately ask, well, when do we need it? By when? And if they see 2030, they'll cherry pick that as a, as an, when in fact it was a much wider range of options, if I remember right. But 2030 was specifically emphasised in the summary, right? I I read the summary carefully last night and nowhere in there does it talk about 2030 for net zero. You know, it's, it's all about um, you know that uh, that being somewhere where we have to have really started and got down, so you know, made a significant dent in our um, emissions to date. You know, aiming for somewhere in the middle of the century to get to net zero if we want to stay at one point five. So that suggests that even, I mean, despite bringing journalists into the fold, doing one's best to make sure that they got the message. In fact, still, what came out was very much a simplified picture. Just to be clear, there weren't any journalists involved in the preparation of the report. <laughs> there were people advising us as scientists science communication specialists who are advising us as scientists um, on what people were going to understand from our graphs. I just to pick up on what James was saying, it was actually a really interesting process for me that they were definitely not there to advise us, say this, not that, because nobody will understand B. But what they did help us do is to say, if you say this, this is what people will take away. And very often, it was quite depressing for me. Uh, In fact, they took our first draft of our figures and showed them to uh, actually um, policymakers, people who were actually climate negotiators, people who were already climate specialists. And they took the first drafts of many of our figures and showed them to these and then got people to write down what they'd understood from the figure. And it was a real eye opener because, you know, what we thought was a perfectly clear figure was actually communicating garbage. And and that really forced us to, to whine, rewind very heavily and just think what are the few very specific, almost stylized um, messages we we actually want the figures to communicate. That in, that was that was a particularly useful part of the exercise. Yeah, no, I'm, I sh- thank you, Miles. I should absolutely stress that those people in that team were not telling the scientists to what to think, but they were just trying to get them to think what might be the interpretation. I just take issue slightly because the reason I'm bringing this up, Helen, is because you know, I was worked for the BBC for far too long probably and far too much of a BBC patriot and probably far too sympathetic but I remember them saying when it said correct me if I'm wrong Morris 
uh, miles and head in. In model pathways with limited or no overshoot 1.5 global net anthropogenic CO2 emissions declined by about 40% from 2010 levels by 2030. I mean, I know that they jumped all over that and said, ah, 2030. You know, I know it's part of the start of a range, but that's the date that's in the SBM. That's what we've got to. And of course, it was a misinterpretation. And of course, myself and others who were you know, sort of part of the team, myself, I stress in a minor role, should have been thinking if I was a journalist and I need a headline, I'm going to go for that 2030 and we need to anticipate. But it was there. And that's what they say. They jumped over it erroneously. Well, I mean, of course, there's an argument about there's an argument to be had about how how erroneous that really is. I mean, the statement is perfectly accurate of the available pathways we've got today. And it's worth stressing these model pathways they're talking about here. These are the global economic models that manage to achieve something like a 1.5 degree future. There are plenty other models that simply fell over yeah. in trying. Fell over, they just didn't compute, didn't it just, you know, computer said no. I mean, it, so it, they it, can't, they said it can't be done. They can't restrict and it so to 1.5. They, they can't get emissions down fast enough yeah. um, and still keep the lights on and keep everybody fed and all the rest of it. So this is actually the minority of models that actually managed to do it. The, 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 so I'm not quite sure it was a minority, but it certainly wasn't all of them. So so there's, there's tables in the report which shows you sort of, you know, crosses basically where the model just failed. Um, and, you know, I think it's important therefore to recognise what, they, what they're actually saying here is... These are reductions at the absolute limit of speed that we might make them. And those ones just about manage to sort of limbo under the bar at 1.5 degrees. Uh, and and th- those ones involve a reduction of around 50%, 40% from 2010, 50% from now um, level uh, of emissions by 2030. So in a sense, that does all stack up. That said... The implication that this is the this is a sort of prescription that if you want 1.5 degrees you have to do that that of course is going one step too far. Couldn't agree more. And and you know so so that that's what we're contending with, and you know the, you can spot these you can spot these tricky sentences in the reports because they're always slightly peculiarly worded, and you can see there's a lot of slightly peculiar wording in that sentence because you know. We had to be very careful what we could and couldn't say about the state of the science at the time. I couldn't. I think that's an incredibly helpful explanation. But I think from a journalistic point of view, you're going to be the enormous urgency to explain a sentence like that in in ways that your audiences can understand it. Isn't that what a journalist job is? So, well, it is. But, but is that such a bad thing then? I, I'm, I'm trying to get to. I mean, given what Miles just said. These various models that worked, they were getting things down by 2030. And given the fact that it's so much easier for the public to understand if you do put a concrete figure and deadline there, maybe that was the right thing to do. The problem is there were two 2030s that people grabbed onto. There was the range of dates at which we might reach 1.5 degrees at the rate we're going. And that was given as 2030 to around 2050. And uh, I personally would be much more comfortable just saying about 2040 and leaving it at that. But they, they were very specifically, they wanted a range. So a range was given. And so people latched onto one end of it. And, and so when I see school kids holding up placards with a burning planet and 12 years left, um, and school kids saying, as they have been, you know, if we don't, if we just carry on as we are, the world will come to an end in 2030. That's clearly wrong. And, and clearly not representing what the report was saying. Um, but it's, you know, that, that narrative has got out there. Um, and so, you know, that's the, the, so there's these, there's these two 2030s we have to deal with. And the other one 2030? Is, one of which is clearly wrong. Yeah. And we can just sort of, and, and, you know, I've written on it and I've tried, and, and there's been quite a lot of work done to try to sort of push back on that one. The other one is this, you know, we have to reduce emissions um, by X percent by 2030. Um, that's that's much less wrong. The only problem is if you try and get too precise of what X is, because you know all it you know all it really means is unless we've really got started on it, um, as Helen put it earlier, you know you've got to get on with getting emissions down. I mean it doesn't you know whether it's got to be thirty three percent or forty two percent, it's neither here nor there. Helen, 
Yeah, I yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thanks, Miles. Yeah, I think we, we really do just have to get started. I mean, the the longer we leave it to to get started, the harder the job is going to be, as Miles has articulated. And that um, those sentences in the reports were just about um, framing that in terms of a sensible range when we really need to have made a significant start. Right. So for policymakers who do actually want to have a target that they can put in a in a law or in re- relevant documents to to pedal to industry the 2030 date with an appropriate threshold is quite a helpful one is it a milestone on the way i would say rather than a threshold that's actually really important this sort of on the way to somewhere else is really important because i think we we fixate on the near term because it's challenging and we know we've got to get through to the near term to get to the long term, but we've got to remember what the long term goal is. And the sort of one of the most important, clear, key messages of the report was to stop global warming. We need to reduce net global emissions of long lived greenhouse gases, that's carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, to zero. And if we want to stop global warming at 1.5 degrees, then we need to get those emissions to zero by mid-century. And so we're at wherever we're at now, we want to get to zero by mid-century. You're going to have to go through a 50% reduction at some point along the way. You know, Again, you don't need to be a genius to work out that getting them down rapidly by 2030, it would be a good idea if that's your long-term goal. But it's got to be a trajectory that gets you to the long-term goal. And there's a lot of things, again, what worries me about the climate emergency, climate panic narrative is that some of the things you might want to do just to get emissions down by 30 or 40% in the short term might not actually help very much to get you all the way to zero. So we've got to think ahead and we have to think where we actually ultimately want to get to. And it's not just about getting emissions down next year. It's about getting down to zero by by, 20, by, by mid-century. Okay. I mean, just okay. If, you, if people are interested, I, mean, the, I agree with much of what you said, but I do think one has to anticipate when you're doing the communicating that if you're going to put 2030 in there, it would have been much better, I think, to put 2040 or, or something else rather than the, the 2030. The interesting thing is actually when my research student, who's called Alex Hare, looked did all the heavy lifting on how the headline travelled on mainstream media. She looked at 18 different media organisations, mostly in the US and the UK. Actually, much to our surprise, the headline narrative, either the mitigation narrative or the impact deadline narrative, was only there in a quarter of the articles. Now, I had the impression, oh my God, it's, it's everywhere. And secondly, that actually when we unpicked and looked at the content of those articles, 90% of them actually reproduced the actual phrasing in some shape or form that the IPCC had done. So actually, even though I am very critical, particularly there were some particularly egregious, bad examples, uh, uh, the independent and others, you know, and CNN saying 12 years left, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, the BBC and many others, New York Times, were much more responsible than that deadline narrative. So I think one does have to be slightly careful before one sort of launches a diatribe about, you know, these irresponsible media who were misinterpreting it. So point point number one. But I don't get me wrong, I still think that that 2030 on balance is not a helpful narrative. And it does worry me greatly that, you know, we've got, I'd much rather they said, you know, system change, not climate change with their placards than, you know, the end of the planet in 12 years or, you know, act the science, listen to the science, act now, rather than we've got 12 years. But- or just perhaps if they were a bit more aware, or a bit a bit more um, articulate about what, the, what they're choosing between, you know, if we leave it past 2030 to really get started, you know, that's not to say can't be done, but it commits us to potentially difficult greenhouse gas removal uh, from the atmosphere, which we don't know how to do properly yet at the scales that's required, and we don't know how long it's going to take us to scale it up, and we don't know um, how effective it's going to be at, at reducing the the warming. And so, and presumably, quite a lot of damage might be done to the environment in the meantime. Yeah, well, there's the there's the continuing accumulating impacts of climate change, and there's also any possible side effects of any uh, drastic, even more drastic action we have to take later if we put off, you know, following the suggestions of the report and getting started with the far easier way of solving the problem which is simply reducing. What are the sorts of problems that we're seeing already through overheating? Well, we're seeing massive increase in the risk of heat waves. So the, the extraordinary summer we've just had in Europe um, is, no longer be- is no longer so extraordinary. Um, and that, that's the sort of most tangible impact that people in mid-latitudes uh, are experiencing. Uh, many of the probably the most serious impacts, of course, are happening in the tropics for the reason that tropical climate doesn't vary very much. So people people depend on it being the same as it was last year. And so 
if tropical climate changes, it's, it's, that's where the impacts are felt first. What is the effect on the tropics? Well, I mean, at the simplest level, it's getting warmer, uh, which means evaporation is happening faster, which means that forest ecosystems perhaps are more vulnerable to drought and associated fire. There have been papers published and other papers I know which are in process at the moment, looking, for example, at the impact of climate change to date on the risk of fire in Amazonia. And that, that's, you know, th- those kind of impacts are, are, are starting to emerge. Huge impacts on tro- tropical marine ecosystems, um, and we've got the IPCC report on the oceans coming out actually today, I think, um, which will be documenting those changes happening. Again, because tropical oceans are remarkably uniform over time systems, they, it doesn't temperatures in the tropical ocean never changes very much. So when it suddenly starts to change, the 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 corals, the the fish, the the animals that have lived there for for tens of thousands of years um, suddenly I don't know how to don't know how to respond and that's the problem take the scenario that Helen was hinting at that some people might favor that we do nothing till 2030 but plan on there being some technical fix that at that point will bring co2 right down obviously we don't know what the fix would be but let's just suppose that that was a feasible option at 2030, what damage would have been done? Well, this is why, as I said to James earlier, the math gets easier as you get closer and closer to the temperature goals you're worried about because you know, another decade's emissions is another quarter of a degree. So whatever we'd have to do now to limit warming to one and a half degrees, if we just do nothing until 2030 and then do exactly what we would have done now, we'll end up at 1.75. And if we did that for another decade, two degrees and so on. It's not It's not very complicated. And these impacts are progressively getting worse. The impacts we're seeing now are the consequences of one degree of warming in the past. All of the models say these impacts accelerate as we move away from our Holocene climate. And so we will see th- these risks of extreme weather um, and risks to uh, vulnerable societies and vulnerable ecosystems getting steadily worse. Will we start seeing these global discontinuities that everybody worries about, these sort of global tipping points, collapse of the thermohaline circulation and so on? I don't know. It's not what the models do at the moment, but I have to be quite careful what everything Helen was saying earlier on about how these models don't really resolve the processes that will be responsible for that gives me pause from being too reassuring about that. And there could be nasty surprises to do with methane, hydrates and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, certainly nasty surprises um, possible at high latitudes, you know, the release of um, methane as the permafrost thaws, uh, methane hydrates under the floor of the ocean, but also things like marine ice sheet instability. You know, if we were to lose Antarctica, for example, if the waters around Antarctica were to warm up to the stage where that the West Antarctic ice sheet was unstable, that's adding tens of metres of, of sea level. Um, and that's really not a reversible change on, on human timescales. So, right. um, so, so, so these are all possibilities. And I, and I think, I mean, I'm interested to know Miles' view on this. I don't know what this, quite what the science says about where these tipping points are likely to be, but I don't know if we can discriminate between 1.5 and 2 degrees when it comes to these kinds of instabilities. Well, that's the difficulty. Everybody would like us to draw a very firm line and say, if you cross this line, if you don't cross this line, you'll be fine. If you do cross this line, the world comes to an end. And it, it just isn't like that. The science isn't like that. And the world isn't like that either. The risks go up. To come back to that smoking analogy, you know, every every additional cigarette you smoke increases your risks, but it's not, you, you can't say, you know, if you stop on this day, you'll be fine. If you sm- continue smoking one day beyond that, you'll die. Can I, mean, can I suggest it's like, well, maybe, it is, maybe the smoking analogy is quite a good one, because as you smoke, right, there are two different kinds of problems you can have. One is that your breathing or whatever gets worse, you, you, the circulation of oxygen and so on. The other is you might get cancer. Both of those increase the more you smoke. And I take it that with the climate, we've, we've got both of those things. We've got one is that as, as it gets hotter and hotter, the continuous effects on the environment are worse in some of the ways we've described. But there's also an increasing risk of something catastrophic happening. And we don't know at what level that becomes likely or how likely. That's right. Yeah. In fact, yes, you put it better than I did. Actually, well done. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. I mean, just it was just lovely listening to you again. Sorry to wear this communication hat, but I love it when you frame it and Miles frames it as managing risk rather than saying we don't know exactly how the, when these impacts or how severe they are, but 
it's about smoking and relating it to people's everyday experiences. Again, quite a lot of evidence out there that if you do frame it like that way, that way, people understand it and do respond rather than saying, well, we're not really very sure at what point this is going to happen or what we really need to do. This is managing risk. So it's just an aside from a communication perspective. I think that sort of analogy and Miles keeps has in the past used, you know, the, the, the metaphor of uh, loading the dice, the more one pumps out a greenhouse gas emission since the atmosphere. It's an impo- really important issue about how you communicate this, these uncertainties and these risks. OK, but the communication of a specific date, 2030, I mean, let, let's again relate that to, to smoking. Now, I can imagine that if you want to encourage people to give up smoking, it might be that it really helps to say to young people say, you better give up smoking by the age of 25 or else. And the 25 might be an entirely arbitrary threshold in a way, but nevertheless, it might turn out to be a good thing if you want to encourage them to take action. I'm not sure you'd find many public health people saying that was a good message, because of course, the immediate message you get is, oh, well, I'll keep smoking until I'm 24 years and 11 months. And of course, a big danger with the 2030 narrative around climate change is actually the opposite of what people think it will communicate, which is, oh, well, let's just wait until 2029 and then think about doing something about it. Right. The the, the Extinction Rebellion and so on suggests that actually action is being taken. A lot of young people are waving these perhaps That's the message they've got. I I wonder Ah. whether that's necessarily the message that everybody's got. I think it points to a really, really important issue here. We don't actually know, and I haven't seen any studies on it, what is it? And what's the messaging that has actually motivated this vast increase in political action by young people? I would suggest, because there's a huge amount of evidence out there, that giving people information about climate change, on the whole, although they're very important nuances, doesn't provoke huge behaviour change in itself or political action. It's to do with how it lands within your social group, the role of social media, the role of your values. I think there's I think there's a danger that we go too far over interpret messaging and more information as a prompter of personal behaviour change is not consonant with that vast body of social science literature out there. One thing I would say, though, on deadlines, I mean, this report was written on a very tight timescale. It was the fastest report the IPCC has ever produced because we had to write it in response to the Paris call and to feed into the Paris negotiations. Without hard deadlines, arbitrary deadlines, deadlines that were incredibly painful for the author's concern, we would not have delivered the report. We have to set... <laughs> Most academics are familiar with this. Absolutely. And, as, and speaking, speaking as one of the last... Um, I was speaking of one of the sort of... The, 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 the person who was always sort of last on the list, the following authors have not delivered their sections. Um, I, I can vouch for the fact that deadlines are absolutely essential for getting action going. So we need to set ourselves deadlines, but we must mustn't make the mistake of thinking that somehow Mother Nature is setting us these deadlines for us. We need these deadlines to act, but that's because we're human. That's just not the way the climate system works. I was just going to follow up on that and ask whether, you know, given that we want to get a significant way by 2030, presumably, I, I don't know much about the way the political system works, but presumably that means decisions need to be made now in um, government, right? Things need to be cast in stone and rather like, you know, um, they are being in New York and the people are making commitments. Um, But decisions and legislation and um, change in practice. So it seems to me like, you know, what people are fixated on the 2030, perhaps they should be fixated on a shorter deadline. We're building houses today in Britain that require natural gas to heat them. That's ridiculous. Because these houses are going to be there in 100 years' time when we absolutely won't be able to burn natural gas in private homes in order to heat them. Because the, there's, no, the, there's nothing you can do about the CO2 being generated by that natural gas. It'll just go out the chimney into the atmosphere. So it's just nuts. And other countries are not doing this. Other countries are thinking ahead and avoiding the colossal bill of retrofitting all their houses in 30 or 40 years' time in order to get to net zero. But what prescription do you suggest for avoiding this? So this is the way politics works in Britain? We could simply change our building regulations to actually require houses, houses to be carbon neutral. And all these new houses we're going to have to build in the next decade anyway, just the house population could be carbon neutral. People won't have to spend what they're going to have to spend on fuel bills. 
and everybody actually ends up better off. I know you're looking astonished that it can be so simple. It is that simple. <laughs> I agree with you. It is that simple. But the question is, how do you reach a political sen- consensus and a rapid political census backed up by public support to get that action? And that's where the role of communication and information comes in. Deadlines work very well for me, for you. Do they work very well in terms of public awareness and support for public policies? discuss you know there's a lot of again sorry to be so boring but there's a lot of literature out there that's saying disaster framing and which you could say climate emergency is not a good motivator of action at the personal societal level it's to do with uh, you know feelings of doom and gloom and we can't do anything it's not very empowering so again i mean i would just so what's more successful well there's a again there's a huge body of literature and it is disputed and contested but everything you know, very crude terms is. yes but in very crude terms i think you do need a sort of you know this is the reality of what we might be facing with a solutions based and this is what you can do about it there's quite a lot of evidence, although it is disputed, that that sort of narrative, if you're talking about the public, I'm not talking about policymakers or NGOs, if you're talking about public engagement and public acceptance for policies that we all recognise we need, you have to think really careful how it's going to land on different audiences. How is it going to land on people who don't care at all about climate change to tell them they got to retrofit their house? That's where the discussion has to be in my this, ma- <laughs> this message actually fits extremely nicely with a central theme of this podcast, which we saw also in the last series on artificial intelligence, that bringing social sciences into the picture is crucial. It's not just a matter for the technical, mathematical or physical scientists. You also, if you're going to improve the world using the technologies. Just let me give you one stat. The wonderful uh, Net Zero conference that Mars and other organised in Oxford last week, was it? Uh, there was uh, somebody who uh, was a speaker who does an awful lot of work on how do you get public uh, uh, consensus and agreement around climate change. And he quoted the figure, which a lot of other people said, the UK C- Committee on Climate Change, that 62% of the changes that we need are either societal or personal change. So how the discussion should be just as much about how are you going to get the 62% of people to fall in behind and strongly support these policies as it is about the science. And yet we spend far more time discussing the intricacies of the science and the complexity and the uncertainty of the science than how, what do we know about how do you get societal and personal change. I know there are people who work on it, really good people, but I still think, and of course I have a vested interest in saying this, <laughs> but I still think we're lagging behind our understanding on our implementation of the crucial element of how do you get uh, popular and societal uh, agreement on these policies that Miles is talking about. In a sense, you know, you could argue we know enough about the science, don't we? We know we've got to take action. We even know probably a lot about the sort, the range of policies that we need. How do you get public consensus, public awareness across the political spectrum to push that forward as a high priority? That's, to me, what the, we should be discussing. A, a very big question. This has been a fascinating discussion. A lot of different themes explored there. Um, just to sum up, I'd be interested to know your personal view on uh, what can we learn from this phenomenon of the the 12 years and the scare and what's come out of that report uh, what could have been done better where do we go from here Helen well as a scientist who's actively working on the climate problem I'd I'd probably say there's still lots we really don't know about the science we've talked a lot about kind of global mean change but less so about the regional impacts of climate change which are going to be essential for us to understand properly when we're going to talking about adaptation uh, and mitigation on a, on, a, on a regional and local level. We've also talked a bit about tipping points and the possibility of irreversible change, and there's still a lot to be understood there. And then, of course, we don't know how the world is going to respond to carbon dioxide being taken out of the atmosphere. So there's lots to be understood uh, if we're going to rely on those kinds of technologies, carbon dioxide removal technologies, to help us get to net zero. Thank you. Miles? Well, this 12-year deadline, it puts me in mind, I've got a son who's a very good and uh, very uh, ambitious rugby player, and and uh, they beat Banbury yesterday. He'd like me to stress that. And that was a very tough match. Um, he was well involved, played really well. The only thing he wanted to focus on afterwards was one pass he dropped. <laughs> and he'll hate me for mentioning that. 
But that's the point. We, we dropped this pass. I'll, I'll accept that. Okay. But basically, the report communicated well. People did understand it. And the main message people have taken away from it is this is a solvable problem. And this is what I keep bringing people back to is we can turn this around. The climate, the, the 1.5 degrees report, the most important message of it was we can still limit warming to well below two degrees. And we've even got a fighting chance of limiting it to 1.5 degrees. Solving it won't be easy, but it can be done. And it's worth a shot. Thank you, James. I would agree with Miles that there were lessons to be learnt and the 12 year one wasn't particularly helpful. But I do think it points to something else just as important as the uncertainties and the fact that this is solved is how do you take general publics in different countries with different ideological positions and different uh, socio-political identities with you? How do you get political consensus to be able to implement the sort of policies that uh, Miles and others have been talking about? There is some research out there about you know, how information lands in terms of awareness, emotional engagement, personal behaviour change, societal change. But I think we do need to put just as much emphasis on that aspect of societal transformations and public acceptance. At a time in the UK, there's greater worry than any other time, according to Cardiff University last week. How do you turn that into effective participation in a political process that, yes, is consonant with the science, but also is mobilised in support of a discussion and eventually support for public support for policies that really help us find a a solution to this terribly pressing urgent need. My thanks again to Miles, Helen and James for taking part in what's been a fantastic start to Series 2. We're glad we're back, and I hope you are too. We want to let as many people as possible know about this series and to inspire as many discussions on climate research as we can. And you can help us by leaving a rating or review on the podcast provider you use or just by telling a friend about the show. Next time, we venture away from Hertford College to Portcullis House in the shadow of the Houses of Parliament, where we'll be discussing the politics of climate change with a very special guest. I'm Peter Millikan. And thank you for listening to Future Makers.